Thank you for joining Circle Optics 360 Pulse. I am your host, Jennifer Sertle, Director of Marketing at Circle Optics. 360 degree imaging is part of everyday life and Circle Optics technology is really accelerating the delivery of life-saving resources, aerospace safety, and enhancing some capabilities for protection. This podcast, 360 Pulse, is dedicated to featuring immersive technology and the innovators working on these capabilities. Today's guest um, is a name you may not know, but you use technology he built every single day. Let me introduce you to Tom Bishop. He is an algorithms expert with 15 years of experience in AI and deep learning and computer vision, computational photography, and image processing. And here you go. Between 2013 and 2018, he developed the core technology at Apple that is powering your iPhone's portrait mode. During his early career as a PhD postdoc researcher, he developed immersive imag um, imaging technology and published papers in the areas such as deblurring, super resolution, depth estimation, um, with applications to novel compu computational camera architectures, including light fields and coded imaging. He later led teams in industry and drove innovation at two startups, applied cutting, age cutting edge machine learning methods to computer vision problems, applied to automated photo retouching products and large-scale imaging recognition. Um, oh my goodness, Tom, there's so much to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love origin stories, um, and I love any young adult indications of your trajectory. What was the earliest memory you have as an innovator? All right. Hi, Jennifer. So um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I, you know, I think... I think I went through many journeys growing up uh, that led me on the path where I am today. Um, early on, you know, I think it was all about computer games. I uh, got my first computer when I was seven years old, which was a Commodore 64, which is a, a 1980s computer. I'm sure not many people remember it today, unless you've you know been been around for a while. Um, but it was kind of revolutionary for me, and that, and, and probably many people growing up then that, that you know you you kind of had to learn programming. To get going, uh, that uh, you know, you you know, used to uh, cassette tapes to load games off of. But I, I quickly got into the idea of making my own games and learning um, basic and assembly language and uh, graphics behind that. And um, over time, I think I got more and more. You know, I later uh, got into I got a, a Mac computer when I was a little older and got more and more into graphics and design, Photoshop, and, and imaging that way, um, which kind of led me on a path. You know, I, I, I did think I, I wanted to create my own computer games, and that was going to be my uh, career. But I, I, I got more into the graphics and imaging side and uh, took up photography. Um, I also, um, you know, worked as a, a freelance photographer when I was uh, a student, and that, that provided some extra income. It also got me really interested in this whole world of uh, you know what we can do with photography and and imaging and cameras and and the intersection of, of technology, computers, um, mathematics, physics, optics, all those things that go together. So that's sort of what what kicked me in the the direction I've gone in. I think that's great. Well, you know, our founder Zach Niazi was the one that introduced you and I together. And of course, I have to give the first question to him. He said, "Can you delve into the technical aspects?" and challenges involved in developing the technology behind portrait mode? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Obviously, you know, Apple's known for its secrecy, so I can't go into all the technical Shoot. aspects. <laughs> I tried to sneak it <laughs> but, in. <laughs> but, you know, I can, I can say um, from, a, from a high level that, you know, I was, I was hired into Apple partly, I believe, because of some of the, the work that I did during my PhD and postdoc that was all all relevant, and um, I mean other other companies have published things on on similar kind of portrait uh, mode algorithms that you know, like on the Google Pixel, for example. And pretty much every phone has some version of this uh, now. Um, but basically, what a lot of these phones are doing is uh, you know separating the foreground from the background. If you have um, you know fundamentally the, the the big challenge, and I think this was um, you know. Allegedly driven by Steve Jobs's vision back then, um, you know there was a there was a company called um, called Lytro. They were doing novel things with light field cameras back in the mid two thousands. I was also working on similar uh, technology um, in my postdoc, um, 
and they, they did uh, artificial refocusing. So after the shot was taken using the slight field information, you could change the focus of the photo. But that used some really complicated hardware. Um, and you know, when it came to Apple, I think the vision was more, how can you uh, create the look of a, a DSLR that's shallow depth of field, blurred background, uh, using what's there on a, a regular uh, camera or um, at least a, a small modification to uh, what was then a single camera on a smartphone. Um, and what, basically what it comes down to is how can you estimate depth from an image? How can you know what's far away, what's close? Um, because these cameras on smartphones typically have very small apertures, meaning you get a, a wide depth of field, but the background's equally sharp on audio, relatively sharp, as well as the foreground when you focus. Whereas with a, a DSLR or mirrorless professional camera, the large sensor, you get a blurred background, which creates that nice aesthetic, which photographers are really looking for. Um, so we wanted to emulate that on smartphone technology. What it came down to, um, and the iPhone 7 Plus was putting in a second camera, uh, which you know enables you to do stereo vision. So from the two cameras, you can estimate what's nearby and what's far away by essentially correlating uh, pixel parts of the image. Say so, uh, it's sort of triangulation. So you know stereo vision has been around for a long time in various forms. It's been used for traditionally machine vision and you know factories and um, all sorts of different applications, um, and uh, you know it's very useful for all sorts of things today, like you know even self-driving cars potentially. Um, however, back then putting a second camera in was a big push, so that was uh, a lot of the the efforts. Um, and then developing the algorithms that would run efficiently on a phone uh, with very in those days limited compute uh, was a, a big challenge. So. Uh, that was a lot of what we did was how to make algorithms that estimate depths efficiently uh, in near real time and then use that information to take uh, a photograph and select the background and uh, simulate the the lens blur the bokeh in in photographer lingo yeah so that's that's a sort of overview and along the way you know many many over the years those methods have been refined and you know now deep learning comes into play a lot and there's a whole other a uh, lot of different ways you can estimate depth, but that was the the fundamental thing back then. It's interesting that um, initially, um, as a freelance photographer, you kind of the the application put probably a lot of freelance photographers out of business because <laughs> the quality of the camera. Like my my daughter, um, she got a degree in film editing, and um, and she now is an influencer and that sort of thing. But like, it's amazing that her camera is obviously over over a thousand dollars. And it's just amazing the the what we can do now with with our Apple phones. Although I'm an Android person myself, and so I wonder is the same technology that you created also in Android, or is that a different technology? I mean, it's it's all all variants of, of similar things. Like I was saying, uh, you can mm -hmm. you can find Google is a little more open, um, and every phone has its own implementation. I, I mean, open in terms of they've published uh, research papers that explain some of the methodology, and you know, it's it's a won't be exactly what's implemented on the phone, of course, but um, the fundamentals are there. And, and th th there's a lot of similarities, but some phones use things like um, uh, PDAF focus pixels, um, which let you use a single lens to estimate depth. Uh, some use pure machine learning methods, but by and large, the, the stereo is uh, used in a lot of them because it's it's uh, most reliable. But all, all these methods have their own problems. So, you know, there's LiDAR and, um, you know, different ways of using infrared projectors or other kind of active light things uh, to estimate depth. So uh, all these things have been pretty much tried over the years by different manufacturers and different amounts. Yeah. That's exciting. So what's interesting and in, in what I think, because we're right, we're six years old. Um, I can't. I don't think we can call ourselves a startup anymore, but we're moving more towards being a little bit more mature. But um, transitioning from a tech giant like Apple to startups is really significant. Um, what what caused you to want to make that shift, and you know what motivated that for you? And then also, how are you adapting uh, to kind of a startup? And that'll be really helpful to our listeners. Sure. Well, you know, I, I was at Apple a number of years, but uh, meanwhile, I had a lot of friends who were at startups here in the the Bay Area, California, 
who um, you know I I followed their journeys and and heard a lot about what they were doing, and that that seemed like an exciting world to me. And I did work at another. Uh, startup in London uh, for a couple of years before I joined Apple, so I had some experience. But um, you know, I think that the ecosystem is very different over here. Obviously, it's it, it, almost everyone you meet at, at an event in in San Francisco is just talking about their startup. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. But uh, that that's the um, the influence you get. So that that was a motivation. You know, I, I felt like well, I want to be part of that, that journey too. And being in a big company like Apple, of course, you can have a huge impact. I mean, I, I don't think you should underestimate uh, the changes that were made to the whole camera industry by, you know, enabling more people to buy smartphones or you know, creating that that impetus that uh, reduced the cost of cameras. That that's my my um, vision is that you know we we've made cameras so good as an industry in smartphones over the last decade that it really. Um, change the face of, of mass manufacturing technology and everything as well. And part of that is driven by the desire to have better photographs. Um, so anyway, that's a little tangent, but that, that was sort of like my the, the, some of the good side of being at a large company. Some of the, the, the negative side is that there is a lot of uh, bureaucracy and you know organizational, um, whether it's hierarchy or siloing or management or different different structures that exist. That's just the nature of any large company. Um, that make it harder to uh, do certain types of innovation. Um, there's, there's actually a book, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, I'm sure many listeners will be familiar with, which talks about this. And I think that was fundamental. That You, you can do a lot um, when the whole organization is behind a certain vision. Um, but in order to do something truly um, like a step change in innovation or paradigm shift, I think startups are a much better place for that. And fundamentally, I'm, I'm, I come from a research background. I, I have the, the energy to, to keep creating new things. That, that's my, my journey. And I was you know, fortunate enough to be able to do some of that within a large organization. But at some point, you have visions that can go beyond what can be done in a team like that. So that, that was uh, what, what drove me to, back to the world of startups. That's, that's really cool. Um, Many machine learning algorithms require vast amounts of training data, and a large corporation like Apple has the resources to develop that training. How, how do you handle that need in the startups you're working with now in terms of training the data to do what it needs to do for your imaging? Sure. Um, I think that that is a fundamental challenge to many uh, startups or um, different types of uh, machine learning. Uh, what we're doing now, I think we're in a a nice sweet spot that we can actually generate our own training data uh, somewhat due to the the type of machine learning we're doing. Um, that can be a combination of simulation and real data, uh, you know, capturing things. But fundamentally, uh, data annotation is a, a complex problem. <laughs> Something I looked at in my last startup, and also somewhat at Apple. Um, it it does take a lot of resources and it has a lot of problems, and that. It introduces uh, certain um, shifts, or uh, it takes into account, uh, you know, opinions from the the annotators and or the way you choose to label a data. So, as much as you can avoid to do that, that can be beneficial. Um, there are also techniques like self-supervised learning that I uh, went in quite heavily in my previous startup, and we looked at various methods where you you know the data labels itself <laughs> effectively. To a certain extent, or you use very small amounts of human feedback in order to uh, correct things. So th those are some of the, the techniques we use. So for those listening, I mean, there is a role that some people, and even Zach, I sometimes call it um, a, a chat GPT whisperer, because everything is really about the query and your ability. So I sense that you're probably really good at asking the right questions to get those kind of learning algorithms. So um so there's two other that are kind of, how do you see computational photography evolving with the advent of these new AI technologies? Yeah, um, I think I think there's a, a lot that's going on in computational photography. Um, overall, we've had a lot of, um, I don't, don't mean to be disparaging, but um, ad hoc and, and handcrafted uh, techniques, which require a lot of uh, skill and intuition and mathematical ability, 
um, when there was less computation available in the past. And now we are entering more of this data-driven paradigm in, in many industries, but it's also in, in computational photography, um, where we can learn from large amounts of images and you know certain properties of different imaging systems. Um, so I think that can then incorporate more complicated uh, aspects of the, the physical process, like, you know, simulating certain optics or sensors um, or, you know, different ways light is captured. And, and really computational imaging, computational photography is all about trying to uh, work around the, the limitations of the hardware in a, a software fashion. Sometimes it's modifying the hardware um, and it is kind of purest form. Um, and that's, that's some of what we're looking at at, at my company, Glass Imaging, um, where we can co-design the lens and, uh, or, you know, the optical system and the algorithms, like deep learning algorithms, to work together to give you a really good quality image. Um, that's as opposed to traditional um, uh, imaging algorithms that typically take whatever the camera gives you and someone tries to, to find a way to fix it up to make it look better. Um, but this is really a more fundamental way of looking at the, the whole system together, the hardware and the software, and say, well, how do you optimize these things to get the best image at the end? Um, and that's really enabled on uh, devices like smartphones or, or other uh, places where cameras are, are installed um, t with edge processing. Um, so being able to run these big deep learning models uh, close to where the, the data is captured on the camera is kind of fundamental. And that's been really only emergent in the last few years that we've had enough computational power to do that. And that has finally, you know, I looked at a lot of these techniques back uh, when I was in academia and we could do them on supercomputers, but now we're running them on devices in our pocket, which is really great. Yeah, that is, it is um, in, in just such a short period of time, that level of transformation and the miniaturization of it is incredible. In the context of AI and deep learning, um, what are your thoughts on ethical considerations, especially in image processing and recognition? And you can, you know, to the degree you're comfortable sharing with our audience. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously a really tough question and can go a lot of ways. Mm. My view is... Um, technology is technology. Uh, it's what you do with it that matters. And I think that's a lot down to, you know, policy makers to be better educated in what the technology does and how it can be used and what are the fundamentals of it, where it can go wrong. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not a proponent of, you know, stopping technological advance for the sake of it or um, being being scared about these things that they can have overreaches i i think we need everybody in society today to really learn about the fundamentals of of uh, deep learning ai um everything related to that what what computers can do what what they can't do um currently and and in the future so i think having more of a you know it, it, it requires a, a systematic change to like better STEM education perhaps and everyone who goes into government even and um, yeah it's it's not an easy topic but I think we can um, make better choices uh, if everyone is informed and I, I definitely appreciate that um, it's an individual as well as a systems issue how about biases is there any way or do you know any technologies that are working to kind of mitigate bias um, and the idea of um, of how imagery can, you know, increase participation, um, you know, tech for good in imaging. Are there any mm -hmm. um, applications that you that you know of that you want to do a shout out for? Or how do we keep our eyes on on that? Because I think sometimes it is having the technology as well as the amplification and some mm -hmm. of the tech for good. I don't know gets as much airtime, if you will. <laughs> ah, that that's that's. Uh, a little bit, a little bit along the same lines. I don't know if I have any particular um, recommendations of certain technology, but um, I've got a, a viewpoint that might be slightly controversial, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Yeah. Um, 
I think people un- misunderstand what bias is and what it means. Um, so in, in machine learning and uh, learning of, of humans and, and, and in general, um, bias is fundamental. Um, you could say it's a terminology thing, but bias actually enables us to learn anything. It's, it's what enables us to distinguish one thing from another. Um, so I actually worked on this, this topic uh, a little bit in my last startup called um, Anomaly Detection, where you're looking for outliers or um, things that don't fit a certain data distribution. Um, and that that sort of poses some fundamental questions in regard, what what are you trying to actually detect in, a, let's say, a classification system? Or which, you, you have a, a whole lot of different variables you're, you're analyzing. Which ones are important to the problem at hand? Which ones are the nuisance variables or noise and and which ones are influencing the result the wrong way so again like like the previous question it it kind of comes down to the people who are analyzing the data and making use of the results of models to interpret them the right way um it, you, you've got to ask the right questions like in order what i'm saying about um the bias being fundamental is like if you want to actually um, learn many properties of like, you know, let's say, um, colors of objects or, um, you know, different words in, in language, uh, different phonemes in speech, something like that. You need to have some distinguishing attributes from those, uh, data, um, building blocks. Um, so it's really machine learning and learning in general is picking out what are the important bits of the information that distinguish things that you care about, and then disregarding the the parts that are less important, different axes of variation. So the, the data itself um, has to be chosen correctly, and the the model uh, isn't the problem. It's it's what data you feed in and how you interpret it. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I asked that question, and I, I really think your answer is informative to us. That um, the term bias is um, is is what's how people are using it. We all have filters, and these filters are essential to uh, solve any problem. And uh, I really appreciate that response. Let's go back to things I think you're going to enjoy talking about. Probably what should work throughout your career. You continue to stay on the pulse. You know, from being that seven year old playing the game to actually creating a discipline around writing papers and actually, because there's the language of of how to fill, you know, there's the language of how do you actually share an idea in the scientific environment, in the yeah. corporate environment. So how, what is it about you that continues to evolve? You know, what, what keeps you, your engine running? How do you learn in such a complex environment? Well, I think fundamentally you've got to stay curious, or at least that's what drives me. Is uh, you know you learn one topic and then maybe you go to another area and you think how can I apply things I learned in the the previous one to this new one and that that's where I think innovation happens as well. But being curious means you're always looking for new information and trying to learn about new areas. For me, that's a, a fundamental thing about a, a researcher is uh, you know and an applied researcher bringing uh, things into into the market as well in in, uh, innovation, Um, looking for what other people are doing, trying to analyze and understand it and draw your own conclusions from the results. So don't take anything at face value, but try to really um, deeply analyze things and um, draw down into what what makes them uh, work or or what's the the intrinsic uh, parts of any like, you know, algorithm or method or um, novel technology that, that distinguishes it from something else. Um, so that that is this analysis plus synthesis strategy. Like to create something, you need to be able to analyze what others have done first, or what um, your own things you've done, where they they work and where they don't. That's yeah, that's where I what I do. <laughs> that's great for all of you. You have been listening to Tom Bishop, um, algorithm and computer vision uh, expert and explorer. 
Um, thank you all for joining us. We would like to thank the Institute of Optics, Genius New York, Luminate Accelerator, AFWorks, Cider Technology, Archangel Imaging, and AUVSI. Special mention to our producers, Scott Fitzgerald at Rockbox Studios in the heart of optics in Rochester, New York. Um, and by all means, I hope you'll subscribe to our program. Find us on X, also formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn. We're very interested in how immersive technology positively impacts safety and human connection. I am Jennifer Siddle, your host, and I look forward to our next program. Mm-hmm.